Hello, everyone. I appreciate all the positive energy in the room here, and I hate to break up the party to get started with the program, but let's go ahead. My name is Trevor James Bond. I'm the Associate Dean of Libraries, and I'm here to welcome you all to the library and to the center of the research enterprise on campus. Whether that means undergraduate students coming here to check out books, learn how to use online databases, meeting classmates at 2 a.m. to work on group projects, or research faculty accessing peer-reviewed literature in their labs or their offices. Uh, the library began in 1893 with Nancy Van Doren, who served as the first librarian and also professor of English, and also uh, supervised the women's dorm. The modest collection that formed the library was then located in an attic room in the first administration building, now Thompson Hall. Under our third librarian, um, Asa Don Dickinson, who had studied with Melville Dewey in New York State uh, before coming to Pullman, the library moved to Bryant Hall. So from that modest start, and for the last 125 years, the library has developed collections and managed resources to support research. Over a century ago, the library began saving precious manuscripts in a fireproof safe, and later in the treasure room of Bryant Hall. President Holland launched the Friends of the Library in 1938, in part by calling <coughs> faculty members at home and telling them they had to join. <laughs> When Holland Library opened in 1950, there was a purpose-built space for manuscripts and archives, as well as the rare book collections. Eventually, these, these different divisions were combined in 1977 to form manuscripts, archives, and special collections. Manuscripts, archives, and special collections currently holds more than 60,000 rare books, millions of photographs, and more than 17,000 linear feet of archives and manuscript collections. That translates to 3.21 miles of collections. As WSU positions itself to be a top 25 public <coughs> research campus, investments such as the one Gary Schneidmiller is making now will provide the library with perpetual support to continue to collect, sponsor public programs and research. This gift will specifically support the preservation and dissemination of Palouse history and the heritage, of, uh, the heritage of communities including German immigrants from Russia, other ethnic Germans, and Euro-American settlers to the region. For if we are to understand our history, to understand this beautiful place, to rediscover past settlement patterns, to look into heritage grains, organic farming principles, we need to preserve, organize, and make available primary sources and research collections. The libraries, and particularly the Division of Manuscripts, Archives, and Special Collections, is the place to do so. Uh, this is a joyous and somewhat unusual event, um, and as such, um, Dick provided me with some ancient Sonoran gold flour recently milled, uh, and I had the pleasure of baking some cookies, so I'm just going to make a self-plug for my cookies. <laughs> 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 Ones with nuts, no nuts, and then a family recipe for Palm Beach biscotti here that would be uh, featured in our um, holiday cookie mailer that will come up later. Uh, so please enjoy those and other treats. And at the very end of the program, if anybody would like to have a behind the scenes tour of manuscripts and archives, I'd be delighted to show you around. So it is a pleasure to turn the podium over to our 11th. President, Dr. Kirk Schultz, who will then be followed by Chuck Egger. Uh, Chuck, Gary, Dick, were all members of the Farmhouse Fraternity. And after graduating from WCU, Chuck went on to found Pacific Foods. Like Gary, he's a very generous supporter to WSU and made possible one of my very favorite spots on campus, the Egger Organic Farm. Dr. Schultz. Well, good afternoon, and thank everybody for coming. It's uh, always a great day to be at Coos, but uh, yesterday our swimming team and our soccer teams both uh, had nice wins, and if anybody know who our soccer team beat, that weaker school off to the <laughs> western side of the state, so it was uh, a great victory for our women as they finalized their season. Um, as Trevor was talking about the university 
in the drive to 25 and our goal to be recognized as one of the top 25 public research universities, the way we get there is with great faculty, terrific students, and fantastic facilities. And the way that we're going to get those particular components of our university is really through philanthropy. We certainly want to aggressively seek support from the state of Washington, but it's those extra dollars that make a difference in excellence at Washington State University. Now part of that is, in my experience in higher education, we always have a set of individuals that are true supporters of the institution. And they may support us athletically, they may support us with building funds, they'll support us with lots of different things and respond to priority needs of the institution. And uh, Gary Schneidmiller is one of those individuals. Supporting the libraries, supporting athletics, supporting other things on campus, uh, we need and continue to need individuals that are supporting all aspects of the institution in these similar type of ways. And uh, for Gary in particular, my son is a farmer at Oklahoma State and uh, he had the opportunity to meet with Gary when he was back for a football game uh, early in the season. And I know they had a terrific time visiting together. He probably did the secret farmhouse handshake and all that stuff that parents don't know about. I just write a check every month. So, um, but it's, uh, it's a farmhouse for my son is a legacy of his leadership development. It's made a huge impact on him at uh, Oklahoma State where he goes to school. And it's great to see a bunch of gentlemen sitting up front that were equally as impacted in their time at Washington State by the farmhouse. So with that, uh, we, Gary, we appreciate everything that you continue to do for Washington State University. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. So go Cougs.
and that I got my cooker and it has not yet moved anywhere in my office. <laughs> my assistant gets very nervous every time she gets startled by looking at this cooker staring at it. And so it's been a great relationship, and for both of and our families, and Gary and, and his mother, uh, yeah, over the years, and I think the, the big common thread has always been uh, Gary's relationship to the Palouse and the heritage of the, the people that lived here, and the people that, and I think he's actually, and, and this would be a good job, job to dig, to do a family tree, but I think Gary is probably related to every uh, family that homesteaded around, or at least knows the story about it. And he started counting up, you know, I have like six cousins, and he was counting up his cousins one day during school, and it was like, how do you even know all that? <laughs> but I think, you know, the dedication that Gary's had in MSU and, and uh, what he's done for the school and what he will continue to do is just remarkable. And he's been a great friend and, and we're, we're pleased to be invited. Thank you. This is a long way back here. Thanks, President Schultz, for being here with the time and the busy schedule. And, uh, thank you, Chuck, for uh, those good words of remembrance uh, for us. Uh, if it's of any consolation, I've, I've only had this tie up because Lois is here, and she says my dress code. And, uh, had to do that. But uh, welcome, everybody. So good to see you. And uh, special friends from uh, recent times and times past. And so, uh, it's just a, it's a joy to be here to honor a very special person here for all of us. Uh, yes, quite literally, far and wide. We have, uh, where's, where's our Amy? We have Amy Heller in here from New York, <coughs> who's uh, very much interested in the, the heritage we've all been talking about in various ways, and many others here that uh, I've known throughout my life in one way or another. It's just uh, a joy to see you all. Always special to have my own family and uh, my wife Lois here up in front. Uh, thrilled she could be with us. We spent time here at this very years that are commemorated in the exhibit uh, that I see. Uh, I have known of Gary's family virtually my entire life and uh, really got a chance to know him and, and Chuck here in those years that are marked. And I'm looking at the student protest, 69 70, and I remember that uh, very well. I remember being kind of shocked by it coming from a sheltered, loose country community, not quite understanding it. I, I did understand not having to take our finals that year. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, uh, that, I never heard of optional finals. And, uh, that, that I don't know if that ever happened again. Uh, you know, there's a kind of business end to what we're here about because we're formally uh, commemorating uh, the establishment of this endowment to promote educational opportunities, uh, seminars, uh, publishing opportunities, and, uh, and the growth of the archives to celebrate uh, not just uh, the heritage that we share as those of, uh, of a distinct background. I won't say it, it is unique, but everybody comes with a unique background. And, uh, and uh, the association of those backgrounds with the Palouse country uh, is, is long been fascinating to me. When we walked in, uh, Carl made note of the fact that we were coming down here in the archives. He hadn't been down to this uh, part of the new library before. And uh, so I pointed out where the, where the old archives was on the other side of the brick wall there on Holland and how well I was acquainted with that place back in my undergrad days. And he didn't say it with his mouth, but with his eyes. I think he said, you must have been one boring guy to <laughs> spend all that time there. Uh, but heritage has long been very interesting to me. Uh, and it's been a guidepost uh, by which to uh, also direct uh, our futures. And so in terms of uh, sort of the business end of setting the agenda for the endowment that uh, Gary has generously made possible. Uh, uh, Trevor, let me open, I guess, by uh, presenting you with, uh, with a couple of original source documents uh, in Russian, from Russia, associated with our people. I've hung on to these things for years and never had a chance to give them. So uh, here you go. Thank you for your good hand. 
I am presenting uh, Trevor documents uh, that relate to the first of our people coming to this area. Now, uh, by the way, I say everyone has a unique history and there are unique things to celebrate about those histories that are special. So I hope you'll permit me just a second or two. By the way, I have hugely condensed uh, the remarks that were phrased there in the, in the outline. If you're interested in the King James Version, I did bring 20 <laughs> copies because I'm an old school teacher, so you can have those. But uh, everybody's waiting for Trevor's cookies. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly uh, through what I have to share, though. But I did want to point out a few of those things to you. Our, uh, Gary and I, and others of you that are here celebrating with us, uh, uh, you may know this is a very special year to us. Uh, this year is the 250th anniversary of our ancestors' immigration from Germany to Russia under the reign of Catherine the Great. It was a big trip, and it took many, many months, over a year actually. They wintered, we think, in St. Petersburg. And we've had this story coming down from our families. Uh, maybe apocryphal of our uh, ancestors actually meeting in person Catherine the Great. And I used to think it was just so much myth until looking deeper into the story, uh, we found out that actually Catherine built a summer vacation home about 25 miles west of St. Petersburg within a stone's throw of the boarding docks. And so it may very well, and we know she was vacationing there, and she did long to hear her native language. She was a tiny uh, the princess of the smallest German principality, it's probably the size of this campus. And so to go from someone with that level of life to reigning over the greatest empire on the planet uh, was, was remarkable. And so, uh, so now we find out through recent research that in fact all this may very well have been possible. And it's interesting that the oral accounts have come down to us in ways that really can inform heritage in important ways. Our people were people of the earth and they had challenging times. Not much has survived since those days. There's a portrait there of Catherine uh, that is from the 18th century. There was a time when Gary and I were traveling uh, uh, the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union where it was remarkable what you could pick up anywhere. Uh, we're desperate for hard currency, and I was very fortunate to obtain some of these materials. Uh, other materials, just because of the goodwill of people who knew that we've been waiting for decades, over two centuries, to tell, to find out our story, that had been closed, you see, because of the tragedies that had happened under communism. And so during that time, I brought out uh, a little over 10,000 pages of material. Uh, and we will be depositing substantial amounts of all this here in the archive, thanks to Gary's uh, generosity making possible this. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you see a samovar there. That, that, was, that, that came about 1900. Uh, uh, our people love fellowship. Uh, I hesitated to say it started at 3 o'clock. Everybody was having such a good time visiting. And, and it will be a good time, I hope, visiting afterwards. We love, we love fellowship. Uh, but the object on the left is of, of uh, unusual significance. Uh, Gary and, uh, Gary's family and my family, uh, uh, many others, some of you here relative to the Schmicks. You, you don't have to have a last name, by the way, starting with S-C-H. <laughs> 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 but, but there are a lot of them. And, um, in any event, uh, the first of our people uh, started leaving Russia for reasons to not purpose here to go into deeply in the 1870s. They came here to the American West in 1881, the first vanguard. And within a year, they settled on a small, little, beautiful prairie along the Cluse River between the communities of Indicott and St. John, where Gary's family and my family came from. I'm just my family. Uh, this tiny little place has uh, recently come back into our family. We call it Cluse Colony Farm, please. It's probably the smallest farm in the Pacific Northwest, but we love the place. And uh, there's only one thing, really, there's only one object that we know of that came with that first group. By the way, to show you the impact they had, these were farm people. There was a lot they didn't know, but they knew how to farm. And they brought with them grain. They brought with them a variety of grain that's actually in that bowl. And thanks to Sean, from Sean Culture Breads, there's examples of them in the back there. 
and Joel, thank you for coming and making those available to us. This grain revolutionized uh, American agriculture. Believe it or not, before the 1880s, there was no such thing as what we call today modern bread. It was all made up of soft white meat, which you, we call a pastry pot today. So it makes a pretty dense loaf. These people bought turkey bread. And boy, when they tasted it, the millers didn't like it because it broke all their equipment. It was hard. But boy, did this stuff make good bread. I have it in my imagination that, that one ancestor of ours who came in 1881, 1882, uh, the wife, who was known to be quite a character, her name was Anna Litzenberger. I'm thinking her husband probably, probably said, okay, honey, you can take one nice thing. And uh, what she brought was that bowl. <clears throat> That's the only thing we know that exists of all our families that came in that 1881 trip. Uh, after they came, it was just a handful of families that settled there on the river. Within 25 years, 100,000 were living in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not just a story about a couple of families. It's a much greater movement and a transformation of agriculture that in partnership with Washington State University has made an enormous impact. And President Schultz, again, so honored with your presence here because it has been the agricultural component of our people's association with this university, support from people like Chuck and Gary that have advanced research in ways that never otherwise could have been made possible. Uh, our memories go very closely back to uh, Dr. Orville Vogel, who was senior meat breeder here in, uh, when we attended Washington State University and was one of the godfathers, uh, as all of you know, of the Green Revolution to help feed a, a hungry world. We so benefited from him. Uh, I'm sure Chuck and Gary and I can speak till midnight just about Dr. Volvo, a very practical man, but a man who really embodied those values that Farmhouse has represented. And it wasn't by accident I chose the words sickle and chief here because that was part of our insignia for Farmhouse. And as President Schultz shared with you about the impact of those values on his son, uh, we certainly aspired to it. I won't say we lived up to it all the time, but we, we aspired to those. And he was a living example of this in a very humble, selfless way. And when I think of those words, I think of people like Gary, humble and selfless. Gary, Gary uh, was, was almost brought here under uh, you know, duress. He's not interested. In, uh, in drawing attention to himself, but I'm shining the spotlight on him anyway, because uh, for a lifetime, he and his family have shown the spotlight on so many others throughout this region and, and beyond. People like Dr. Volvo were beneficiaries of their support for research here, and it's gone on to change the world in wonderful ways. We have so many challenges we face. I direct teacher certification that's from the year of Seattle Pacific University. And I have to tell you, it's not always easy to look out on an audience. I was thinking back the other day at the time I've been at over 500 teachers certified. And I and I it's my job to kind of give them a pep talk. And one thing I refuse to do is falsely get their hopes up about what's happening out in public education or working with young people. And the first thing I always used to tell them was don't go into this job unless you're prepared for it, morally, emotionally, physically, but most of all, philosophically, to know that there's nothing more important in life than to promote the well-being of young people. There's nothing more important in life than to promote the well-being of young people. So we look to the next generation, how can we do this? Well, one very practical way is through gifts like Gary is making possible now and has made many other realms as well. And so uh, I'm extremely grateful, Gary, that you would honor us by this. And, and I look forward to seeing what new will come of this. Dr. Vogel is greatly interested in history. I was one of the few people who knew Dr. Vogel before coming to WSU uh, among my house members because while he was a famous person, even though he would never proclaim it, by the way, won the National Medal of Science uh, presented at the White House, uh, he was what I would say common as a shoehorn because he was out there working with people like my dad, Gary's dad, and others in the fields. And, uh, and so I look forward in working through Gary's gift with the fields that are in the archive and the things we will be bringing Trevor to the archive because they are substantial. 
and it was exciting to make that happen. I'm not worried that my notes fell because I haven't followed them yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, I decided to, to cut to the quick here as I finish because I've already consumed the amount of time I wanted to speak. And what I was going to do was, was tell a story. And I'm going to finish just with a portion of the story. And those of you, like I said, who want to see the whole thing, uh, yeah, you're welcome to, uh, to have it because I do, uh, I do uh, have copies of it here. I've been working on a manuscript. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> Bob Clark is here from WSU Press and Ed Sella and their whole team here. I've been so privileged to know them because uh, part of the work we're doing is wanting to promote the work of good publishing and storytelling. And this, uh, this makes it possible. Bob and Ed and all of the work with you. We're very grateful. In, uh, in conclusion, since I haven't shared anything else I intended to tell you here, except to thank Gary, um, I did just want to conclude with a moment about uh, a trip that Gary and I took. And this was a trip back to our homeland. We grew up hearing about these places. It was like Brigadoon. It was like a place that never really existed, but that we heard from all of our ancestors. I'll tell you what a boring kid I was when I was a teenager. Now, I did like basketball. I did like baseball. Not football so much. I did like coming to Kruger games, and did as a kid. <clears throat> but I liked talking to old people. And I decided when I was in my teens that I would interview every person who had been raised in the old country that lived in our communities of Endicott and St. John. I don't know if I did make it to all of them, but I think I made it to most of them. And I wanted to find out from them what was life. They, they talk about life in, a, in another dimension, not just another time, it's another dimension. There were no machines. It was all hand work. It was side work. Lois's grandfather, Adam P., coming with nothing. 65 cents, I think, he had in his pocket. He ended his life with 1,200 acres and a good work ethic. And when we went to their home after he passed away, every extra piece of tin foil and string was all carefully folded and placed in the basement. And paper sacks, as I recall. Um, these were thrifty people who worked hard. And yet they talked about life in a time that was unimaginable. We planted potatoes by the Good Friday moon. We did all these things growing up, and, and they go back to medieval times. When you, when you think about the connections and the associations. And so Gary's relatives and others that I visited with in those days, now I'm coming to see, have more significance. I'm interested now in writing about those. I really have not devoted a lot of time to recasting those in story form. When Gary and I traveled back to Russia and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was finally possible well, first of all, to see if this place even existed. We weren't all that sure. We didn't have satellite photos back in those days. And by the way, the area had been off limits since the Russian Revolution. A few had gone in in the 1920s for famine relief. And I met the woman who headed that work, Emma Haynes, in Washington, D.C. And uh, she was the last one. That would have been about 1926. And uh, we finally made it down. We, uh, we, we got to this very obscure place on the lower uh, Volga River. We passed stubble grain fields, an immense congregation of ochred sunflowers bowed with heavy heads for harvest offerings. The murky gray skies we had known for several days dissipated into a ceiling of loosened turquoise. Climbing the gentle rise for which the colonists had named the west side of the Volga, Berkziaita. We spotted a sign. It said, Yagadnaya Palyana. And we grew up hearing this from all of our elders. They all talked about Yagada Palyana. Berry Meadow. It was Berry Meadow. It directed us off an eastward dirt road from the main highway that deteriorated shortly into a rutted lane. We began descending steeply through a gilded cowl of quaking birches. Visible among the white birches was an endless aisled carpet of moss and frosted woodland flora. Our family elders had gathered there long ago to gather mushrooms and strawberries. In the distance appeared the outskirts of the village. Still, many of the log homes that were built in the time of Catherine the Great. 
We learn that the family of an elderly, that, that an elderly couple had recently returned there. Our people during the years of the Japanese internment had a kind of reverse internment. All the Germans living in Russia during World War II were exiled to Siberia, those who had survived numerous tragedies, many of which led to their murder. So we had no idea, even if there were any of our people that could come back to the village by the 1990s when Gary and I traveled there. We had heard about a couple, George and Maria Schneidmiller Charm. They allowed us into their home, shared their incredible memories of the beautiful land and life that had beckoned their return. Other members of their family later gathered. They showed us the timbered remnants of the village's old barns, the granary, the location of the threshing floor. I went into the barn, was accompanied with them, and Gary, I honestly do not remember. We had all dispersed. I don't remember if we were together at this moment, but we were together at this same place at the same time. And I noticed on the side of the wall was a very experienced sickle. It had a sharp, serrated metal blade that still looked keen, and it was keen, because thanks to Chuck Egger, we cut a llama's crop two years ago, and I used that sickle. My friend grasped his wooden handle. He held the tool at his side as if a figure in a painting by Millet or Repin. You must have it, he smiled wistfully. Amidst all our sorrows, the land has always been good to us. Gary, I've been trying to think about how I can best symbolize in a small way, because nothing to do the goodness you have done in so many ways to so many people. If you've been to Gary's office, you know, it's the closest thing to the book. This <laughs> side of the home. And in fact, there is nothing produced with the WSU insignia uh, that I think Gary probably doesn't own, probably in quadruple. <clears throat> I've been blessed by blankets and many things over the years, and as I think back to what treasure we tried to approximate in a small way, what the great truth is that Gary has done for so many, including myself, uh, I thought to myself about that story that's branded in my mind about that trip he and I made to Yagodnaya Polyana, and it occurred to me, Gary, that this was from Georg and Maria Schneidmiller Shire. I got to thinking, you know, the women did as much work in the fields as the men. Maybe this isn't the Charmin sickle. I think it's, for at least the next lifetimes you and I have, I think this is the Schneidmiller sickle. <laughs> so please, come and I hope find a place for that. <laughs>
journeys to another life. Uh, and of course, it's amazingly interesting she was because of our families, our parents, our grandparents, and this is very special thing. But thank you. documents he just delivered, and uh, again, if anyone would like to see the department behind the scenes, I'd be glad to show you around. Thank you all so much for coming out today on this beautiful fall afternoon. Cheers. Thanks, Robert.